Welcome, friends and fans, to another episode of GalaxyCon Live, where we are bringing the convention experience directly to you. And today, we are going to hot patootie like a bat out of hell by way of the Fight Club and beyond with an amazing guest. So without further ado, let's bring him out. Our guest today is an internationally renowned musical artist and actor whose body of work includes Ghost Wars, Fight Club, The Rocky Horror Picture Show, and of course, several albums, including the diamond-selling Bat Out of Hell. Please welcome Meatloaf. Wow. That was some introduction. <laughs> oh, thank you, sir. I, 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 you, 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 you have earned it. And well, all I got to make sure my hair is okay. <laughs> um, so, yeah, wow. Ah, thanks for joining us, boss. How you How you doing? I'm doing fine. How are you doing? Uh, I am well. I'm I'm in Orlando, and uh, we are we are holding up. Yeah, how are you doing? Okay, through the COVID thing. Yes, sir. Uh, you know, I, I've left my house to go to Kroger's. There you go. There you go. Yeah, Joe. Jo. And we and Publix, Publix and Kroger's. Oh, another one, Fresh Market, which is very good. There you go. There you go. To, go to have different surgeries. I had, oh. just had this one uh, 10 days ago. Oh, my. And I had, uh, I'll show you this. This one, can you see that scar? Yes, sir. That, yeah, that was a big one. That had, I, I <laughs> my shoes, I was wearing clogs. So uh -huh. anybody who's watching, don't wear your clogs that are too small on a wooden floor. It'll throw you like you're being thrown through uh the front window of a car and it threw me into the stove top oh gracious and it broke my arm and i had to have two plates put in oh. and the bone to the elbow so oh. I went home and because of covid i couldn't get to the dentist so i had to have oral surgery to take teeth out oh <sighs> and then they found on my face there's you can't see it now but they found these cancerous cells, but it's no big deal because they said, all oh, these cells don't travel, so don't worry about it. I go, oh, okay. So that's Good. one, two, three. Uh, it's four surgeries, and I have to have one more January 14th. Wow. It's a basal cell. Is that what it is? Yeah, I guess so. You know. Yeah. About yeah, yeah I've, 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 had, I've had a few myself. Oh, okay. There you go. Yeah. They to, to carve, out little, carve out little patches and send you yeah, home. Yeah. Like, like, what are you doing? <sighs> It, it certainly is weird. Well, I agree. It, it's been a trying year, but uh, I like to think. For I think anyone listening, it's been a trying year. There's nobody out there that hasn't had a trying year. So yeah. we're all in the same giant boat. Absolutely. Absolutely. And because of this year, we can't uh, do our physical shows, but instead we have this format called the GalaxyCon Virtual Stage, and it's an absolute pleasure to have you here. And I can't wait till next year because I believe after June, There'll be live shows again. I am so looking forward to that. As yeah, again, we are so prediction. looking forward. That's my prediction. We would love a few months, but next year you're going to have shows. We are absolutely looking forward to getting you back on our stages and getting you back in front of all your fans. Yeah, I can't wait. The fans are everything. Are you kidding me? Anybody that's in my position owes everything to the fans. They the fans are responsible for building the road that someone in my position has been able to walk down. And yeah. it, it, every artist should be eternally grateful to every one of those fans. Absolutely. I mean, that's the bottom line. Absolutely. So our team right now is going to the chat room and pulling out the questions. In the meantime, I have some of my own. Uh, and I always ask this when I have a solo guest, uh, what inspired you and made you decide you wanted to be a performer? Uh, let's see. Okay. We go to my junior year in high school and I played football. So the first half of the year, I only had one study hall. The second half of the year, they were trying to put me in two study halls. I went to the counselor. I said, you've got to get me out of the study hall. What can I do? And she goes, and she named things. She goes, well, there is a, uh, a drama class. I said, I'll go there. So originally, first three days, I sit in the back of the room. I don't know how many people know this, like Fonzie, you know, and Happy Days Day. Yeah. I'm cool, baby. And after the third day, I was in the front row because it was unbelievable. Now, move forward about, I was going to four years, but no, I moved forward a few more years. 
and go to um, uh, March of 1971, and I'm at a party. I'm in the cast of Hair on Broadway. Mm -hmm. I'm at a party, and a gentleman by the name of Teddy Neely, who played Jesus in Jesus Christ Superstar, and his girlfriend, Kate Cole, came up to me and said, you know, you're really good at what you do, but you need to figure out if that's what you want to do, because you need to take it seriously. Hmm. And it hit me like a frying pan upside the head. I liked the party right then, went home and went, yeah, okay, this is what I'm going to do. And since that moment, I have given, I don't know if I was before, I probably wasn't, but I think I was, it's just my instinct. But since then, there has been nothing including talking to you and everybody we're going to talk to, that I don't give everything that I have to give to everything I do. And that's the key to anybody doing anything. If you, if you slouch in one thing, you're going to wind up doing it in another. So just don't buck up and give everything you got to give. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. During those theater years, uh, when you were knocking around uh, New York, you got involved with the uh, the National Lampoon show Lemmings, I believe, through uh, John no, Belushi. I, I, okay. The only play, <laughs> the entire time, the only thing I didn't get in an audition, I went and auditioned for Lemmings. There was an yeah. opening. Right. And the, the director hired a guy named Fluffer Hirsch who lasted about a month and they fired him. Mm -hmm. And the director's name was Tony Hendra. And if I hadn't seen him in years, but every time I would see him in the seventies or eighties, he goes, I'm so sorry. I made the biggest mistake when I didn't hire you. So in a, mm -hmm. in, in a sense, I did get hired. Yeah. So it, my streak continued, but, um, I, that's where I became friends with John and I helped John, John and I, a few years later, I said, cause I helped John move. So John and I were carrying a couch down one of the streets in the village. And a few mm -hmm. years later I said, John, can you imagine what would happen now if me and you were carrying this, the couch down the street? He goes, what? I said, we wouldn't have to. I said, there were people that we just go, will you carry this for us? And so he laughed. And so, I became very good friends with John. In fact, John and I went together to, for the audition of Saturday Night Live. He went, to, there were, at the time the original casting was, they wanted a singer to sing a hit song every show. And yeah. so that's what I was auditioning for. I didn't have a monologue, but you needed like three monologues to audition. So I sang, and there was a problem with somebody else, but we won't get in the middle of that. No and then John and Gilda, uh, Gilda was a very good friend. John and Gilda lobbied Lauren Michaels from the day Bad Out of Hell got out until we finally got on the show the second to the last week of the series that year, 78. Yeah. And normally if an artist went on, I know my, question, my answer's long. If, well, an, if an artist went on Saturday Night Live back in 77, 78, he would sell, or that art, that band would sell 50,000 copies the next week, which was a ton. Yeah. You know what Bad Out of Hell sold the next week? Over 260,000 copies. Wow. And people have gone, do you know why? I go, I think maybe it's because I did something somebody had never seen. At the end of All Revved Up, I screamed at the top of my lungs and attacked the camera. Mm. If you watch it, you can see it on YouTube. I think yeah. I, I finished the song and just run right at the camera screaming. Yeah. I, said, I think people went, wow, what is this guy? I've never seen anything like it. <clears throat> and now you have, but then you hadn't. And and who was the guest on that show? The great Christopher Lee, the horror he icon himself. Right. He was. And he, what did he say? Oh, he said, meat loaf. They yeah. turned it his introduction, they made it a gag, and then like the director yelled, No, oh, I'm sorry, meatloaf. Yeah. I thought he'd call me Mr. Loaf. Yeah, I remember yeah. that now. But I was listen, I was so freaked out, I was so nervous. John had put me in his dressing room 
and made me lay on the bed and told me, don't move till I come and get you. Wow. And I, I, I'm going, I got him. And I was up walking around the room, but I was afraid to leave. <laughs> John, that, that's your job. I was afraid I can't leave. John's going to come back in here and yell at me. So I, I didn't leave. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't stay on the bed. I turned on the TV and was watching what was going on. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. And, uh, and from there, certainly your musical career and, and the acting stuff certainly kicked in. One thing in particular that I've always adored, it's, it's a small movie that a lot of people aren't aware of, but it has such a tremendous cast, is Americathon. Yeah. Uh, Elvis John Costello is in it. I, I don't remember what Elvis Costello did, but I see his name on the poster. He did. He did. A, he did a musical number to it, and you did a very athletic role. And we actually have. Uh, yeah, here's the poster. And there and, I am. See the the. It look in the middle between the legs, and you can see a football helmet or a helmet with a, yep. a red helmet with a white stripe. That's me. Well, we actually have a clip. <laughs> Let's go, ahead, let's go ahead and play it up. Uh, and to preface this for our audience, the plot of Americathon is from 1979, taking place in the distant future of 1998. America is bankrupt, so in a crazy scheme, they have a telethon to raise money. Uh, Beatloaf uh, plays a character known as, uh, as Oklahoma and Evil Knievel Daredevil Hello. character. His name was Oklahoma Roy Budnitz. Yes, Oklahoma Roy Budnitz. And because they're... They're, because of the energy crisis, there's no cars. So they say, well, nobody has cars anymore. Let's have him beat up a car. Okay. So, you mean to tell you where the car is supposed to have come from? You mem remember the movie, The Car? Yes. The car was supposed to be the car from the car. Really? It's oh, wow. The exact car. And for those who don't know, the movie, The Car, is about a car possessed by the devil that I ran over know. people. <laughs> And I killed the car by stabbing it in the oil tank. But now I appear in the movie again yes, you do. on stage. And do you know who escorts me out onto the stage? Refresh Dorothy Stratton. Oh, that's right. That's and right. I went backstage and talked to Dorothy Stratton for four hours. Oh, wow. And she was sitting in my lap. Hmm. I'm a sex god. But anyway, that, that's, another, that's another day. So anyway, I, a, I asked her all the questions because she told me she wasn't happy being a playmate. Mm. That didn't make her happy. And right. the reason she did it was because of her boyfriend. Yeah. She said, well, you shouldn't. Let your boyfriend control your life like that. Yeah. I became a guidance counselor at that point. Yeah. And, and she was very sweet and very nice and really wanted to be an actress now and didn't like, she liked going over to the Playboy Mansion because she liked Hefner. Sure. And she liked, they treated her very kind and very sweet. And she made a lot of money. And she was happy with that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, uh, she she wanted to get away from that guy and yeah uh, a, a tragedy and she Absolutely. should have i mean yeah she there was people willing to help her and she thought she didn't think the guy would do anything but he did he became completely insane yeah um uh, she has become a cautionary tale and i think society and i think that world we have learned from that tragedy so there's something in that some minor recompense yeah, but she was, she was really nice very sweet i've heard i've absolutely yeah, heard yeah, really exceptionally sweet yeah indeed not so. at all pretentious nothing you know and i had a lot of fun with her for four hours just talking talking yeah yeah no yeah in the middle of a hundred thousand people so and it was great. She walked me onto the stage, and I think she came and got me. Nice. <laughs> Not there forever. She had <laughs> absolutely. So our team, let us know. We have questions for our audience. Good to go. So let's go ahead and roll our first one. And well, let me finish before that. Oh, that movie was so much fun to make. And when I was on top, I was going to tell you on top of the car. I was yeah. on top of that car for a long time. Yeah. And at first I started riding it, but I was, I kept sliding off going under the ground. 
Yeah. I'm going, I'm going to hurt myself. So they, they drilled a hole in the car and they hooked me on. So oh, wow. I could twirl around, but I wouldn't fall off. So right. they, no, nice. On. Okay. Very good. And again, thank, th thank you for, thank you for this. Uh, yeah. yeah. And again, anybody out there, I, I, I recommend it. It's a very, it's a very fun movie. So no, it's and, really great. It's a great little movie. Absolutely. And our, our first question of our audience comes from Charles and he wants to know what takes more effort singing or acting and which do you prefer more? They're, they are, they are basically the same because if, if you're real with both of them, it, always involves the truth and when i sing this is true i don't hear myself sing i don't listen to it because i'm so involved with the character and so involved with the truth of the song and the same with acting you don't you, you know your lines but when you walk into the scene you don't know your lines. It's all has to do acting. You can't rehearse a line because if you're listening to the other person as they're talking to you, you can never say your line wrong. Yeah. And you always have to be a lot, your eyes. I'm going to kill everybody. You watch movies and you see anybody, their eyes don't light up. They have dead eyes and they're not really, they're sitting there waiting for their line. They're going, Okay, my line is, so take him with you. So take him with you. Take him with you. Take him with you. And that's all they're doing. They don't hear the other person. But if they're hearing the other person, they can't say the line wrong. Yeah. It's the truth. Yeah. And singing is about the truth. And give me another 30 seconds. Singing is about the truth. And I watch the singing shows and... They all go, well, you have to feel the song. Now they've gotten to the point where they go, you have to become the song. But the only person I've ever heard say this line is Miley Cyrus. And she goes, you don't feel the song. You don't become the song. You are the song. Yeah. And that is the truth. And that's how you find the truth. Okay. All right, Charles, thank you. That was a great question to start us off with. And what do we have next? From Jason, who have been some of your favorite women to sing with? Uh, well, when you, uh, okay, when you, when you're young and you make an album and you've got a girlfriend that sings, you want to get her on the record. Yeah. So I'm I'm in the car with Jim and we've come back from Woodstock and I say to him, listen, why don't we write a duet and let's let me and Ellen do it? Because Ellen and I were dating. Yeah. And I said, I had this. And so I started feeding him this thing. I said, I had this red car, a Galaxy Ford convertible with a dashboard that lit up the sky. And I had a girl. And this is a true story. I had a girl that every time would we get everything and she just goes stop right there <laughs> and so jim wrote about the dashboard and stop right there and so then i broke up with her and went to the started dating a girl named marcia mclean that was on a soap opera and marcia is the voice of the woman that says jimmy goes on a hot summer night with joe and she goes Will he offer me? And that's Marcia. Yeah. So Ellen was one of my favorite, but I have to I have to say, uh, Patty Russo was unbelievable. Carla is an is an actress, so Carla was an absolute dream to work with. Patty was a dream to work with, but my favorite woman of all time is Cher. And the duet I did with Cher, which was not a hit in America but was a hit overseas in all the countries and, and got played in Canada and I think it was top 10. But Cher, I said to the record company, Cher is the woman can sing this song. And they go, you don't want Cher. She's persona non grata at radio. I said, I don't care about radio. I care about 
the song. The song is everything. I said, I want Cher. I send the song to Cher. She agreed. She walked into the studio. She knew the lyrics. She knew the melody. She knew exactly what to do. She came in. She did it. She was done in three hours. Wow. Then we came time to do the video. I said, we're going to do a video. She goes, what? I said, we're going to make a film of this song. She went, oh, that'll be fun. I said, yeah. So we get there, and they, they, it's side. You shoot her, you shoot me. They shot me first. And I, we shot the first verse up to a certain point. And I finish, and she looks at me, and she goes, you're serious about this? I went, yes, ma'am, I am. She went, okay. And she went dead on serious. But if you see the video, and it's been played on MTV, but yeah. it was shot in 81, what, three years before MTV? I already had, I'd already shot, I don't know, 12 videos before yeah. MTV because I knew it was coming. Mm-hmm. And uh, one of the guys who went on to be huge in there was working with a college rep for me at, at CBS. And they moved him up to CBS or they'd ask him to join this new venture called MT, uh, MTV. And he came to my apartment and said, what would you do? And I said, I got news for you. Go with the MTV. That's that's the wave. Yeah. That's where it's heading. And he went there. So I gave him good advice. But they did show it. But if you go on go on YouTube again, look at the look at the video. And that's my softball team that comes in in the beginning. Okay. But at the very end, there is a painting of a nude woman behind me and Cher. Mm-hmm. And I can't believe that that's there. I didn't know it when we shot it. Yeah. And MTV has shown it with that naked lady being in there. So there you go. <laughs> right on. That's my venture into R rating. <laughs> yeah, R. Uh, Baron. Jason, thank you very much. That was a great question. Uh, what do we have next? From Adrienne. Do you have any memorabilia from any of your movies roles? Well, uh, Probably the one that's the most important. I have a lot, but I have Eddie's vest from Rocky Horror. Ooh. I, I was offered a lot of money for that, but I've got a lot of stuff. Um, I have a pair of shoes. I wore in some of it. I couldn't tell you what movie. <laughs> and I got a couple of jackets that I wore when I was detective, you know, those detective, you know, when you're, when you're not a, a uniform officer, you're a detective. So you got these kind of jackets you wear. Yeah. Um, uh, Danny wears them on NYP Diva Blue every once in a while. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I got stuff like that. I have a pair of shoes, but I don't know what from a movie. I have plenty of shoes from a movie. I got all kinds of silly things from movies, but Eddie's vest is, a, is the best. Uh, was there anything from Fight Club? Uh, I don't think so. Okay. Other than a poster. That's fair. it. I don't think there's anything from Fight Club. Yeah, but fair. First of all, I couldn't take the clothes because I was wearing a fat suit. Yeah, you were that prosthetic. and Yeah, yeah and it weighed 44 pounds. Good God, really? Yeah, and the breast weighed 20 of the 44. Wow. So I can say this, and I don't mean to offend anyone, but I now have any woman with large breast her neck is killing her and i yeah. know that for a fact because i had 20 pound breast <laughs> yeah yeah that was and my yeah. neck was killing me through the whole movie and i couldn't go off to the all the different tables and things that they went to for snacks and stuff like that uh and you can see the breast there they're full of flax seeds the whole suit is flax seeds oh wow from my you see where my cuffs, that my shirts rolled up? Yeah. It went from just above that, up around, and they cut it around so my shirts can be open, all the way down to just above my knees. Wow. And it weighed 44 pounds. And it first came out with uh, foam rubber, which was not so bad. And yeah. they you went, no, 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 no. That doesn't look real. And so wow. he goes, I know, seeds of some kind. So they pulled it with flax seeds. Wow. Yeah, I was about to say, because foam was back at the time, a flax. Okay, fair enough. 
Well, wow. and it looks very real with the black seed. So True. I'm happy. And hey. I'll, there's another story, but I won't tell it. <laughs> Fair. It's, a, it's, it's bad luck. Fair. Adrienne, thank you. Wonderful question. Yeah. Well, good question. And what do we have next? From, from Kay. would like to know, what is the most memorable experience from the Rocky Horror Picture Show? Uh, yeah, I, either the film or the production. Well, that's easy. Uh, being on the set with Susan Sarandon, a young Susan Sarandon in brawn underwear. Uh, yeah, that. I don't, you can't top that. There's no top. The, the one thing, and when they, they cast me as Eddie, they had a meeting in the LA cast and said, there's two people from the cast going to do the movie. Tim Curry, obviously. And Milo's going to go do Eddie. I was ecstatic. And I didn't say anything about Dr. Scott because they didn't say Eddie and Dr. Scott because in the play, I played Eddie and Dr. Scott. And I, Richard O'Brien wrote that, it wrote it that way for a reason. And the reason was that Dr. Scott had to have so much. He needed to find Eddie the passion in him finding Eddie. He was desperate. I mean, he was desperate to find Eddie. Yeah. Now, Jonathan in the film is a great actor and he was the narrator in the London production. Yeah. And, but, and he was a great actor and he did the part great, but he was missing, and it's not his fault. He was missing the desperation that Dr. Scott would have had had he been Eddie, not knowing that he was Eddie, but instinctually that desperation was there. Right. And I said to the director, after I got there and we'd walked through the rehearsals, I passed him, I said, you're making a mistake not having me as, as Dr. Scott. He goes, no, we're fine, we're fine. Came back on the set, what, 10, 11 days later, and he passed by me, he goes, you know, you were right. I said, right about what? And he goes, uh, Dr. Scott, I said, I told you so. Well, you great. Listen, I was so thrilled to be in that movie, and Jonathan was great, and the, and and, he, and the movie got better. Uh, where it would have paid off for me to be Doctor Scott was in the laboratory when they were all in there with Rocky and Eddie comes out. That section of the film. After that, it all worked great, but that was, and I think that was the reason it didn't come alive right away it took a little bit to grow now it's it doesn't make any difference but i was thrilled to be eddie trust me i'm not upset and not doing dr scott at all because i have to do it in the play and i got to do it with tim and tim you know what was that 73 and so i'd been in acting classes and had acting classes and they'd always talk about being in the moment, being in the moment. And you go, okay, I got that now. I'm in the moment. Great. Tim Curry taught me what it meant to be in the moment. Yeah. On the third. Now in rehearsal, it always we always did it the same way. Uh, well, Frank and Furter, we made it last. And he said something, but I he had the first line, and I can't remember what it was. I think it was the opposite. Well, Dr. Scott, we meet at last. And he said it the same way in rehearsal every time. Yeah. The first two shows said it the same way. And I said my line the same way. Third show, he said his line completely different. Before it was like this anger. Well, Dr. Scott, this time he laughed and he goes, <laughs> Dr. Scott. We meet and last. And I'm sitting there going, oh, my God. If I say my line the way I've been saying it, I'm going to look like the biggest idiot that ever lived. And I'm, it felt like I sit there for an hour. I had to flip my line to make it so I didn't look like a moron. And I said it. And after that, I knew what it meant to be in the moment. Yeah. Tim Curry, thanks to Tim Curry. Yeah. Tim Curry taught me a lot. Tim Curry is a great, great actor. 
absolutely on 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 stage and on screen yeah he is a consummate professional no question about that so and he was so, he was so scared doing the film that he asked me to go for a ride with him i said okay and i just listened to him we drove around london in a taxi cab for over two hours oh wow and after a while i said to him tim you know what you're great and whatever you do is going to be great so don't think about it anymore just do it and like you said in the movie don't what is it don't do it just be it or something like that something like yeah don't dream it just be whatever it is just be it i said just be it and i don't know if he was still nervous I mean, we talked after that, but we never talked about him being nervous again. But we rode around in a taxi for over two hours. Wow. And we just didn't listen to him. Fair, absolutely. Well, he had nothing to say, really. I mean, it's, he was venting. Yeah, so, you were there. You were there. Bro. You were you were supporting him. You were being yeah. you were being, you were being yeah. a good yeah. castmate and, and a pal. Even though he knew Richard and Nell and and Pat from the London production, he had been working with me for the last seven months in LA. Yeah. So at that point he was closer to me than anybody else. Sure. Absolutely. And so he just picked me and we went riding. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Listen, I love the man. And in in uh I, I mean I I absolutely love him and he really did teach me the most valuable lesson an actor can ever learn and that is be in the moment. Yeah. Very much so. Well, thank you. Kay, thank you. That was a great question. And I think we have time for a few more. Let's see what we have next. I'll try to be quicker. <laughs> oh, yeah, we're a quality over quantity show. So okay, it's, good. Yes, yeah, it's, it's all good. But it's all good, boss. Just let it breathe. And from Desiree, we'd like to know, oh, do you have a favorite piece of sports memorabilia? This okay. is very interesting. If you and I had a fun conversation. Yeah, about well, you, if, if you just see what's behind me you can't see everything but i've got several i'll tell you really quick i'll go fast to them the jersey sitting behind me uh it says orioles is by one of the most famous baseball players ever he's in the same with same league as babe ruth and ty cobb and and uh, lou gehrig and that it's cal ripken and i sing an anthem at camden yards and I was leaving. He said, oh, they, they said, oh, they want you to come in the locker room. So in the locker room, I was talking to some of the players. And all of a sudden, I heard a voice call me. So I went over, and it was Cal Ripken. So we talked five, ten minutes. And I said, well, I'll let you go. And he goes, well, let me give you something. And that was the jersey that he wore in the game. He took it off the peg, signed it, and handed it to me. I said, does it smell? <laughs> and then and, and he just looked at me. I said, no, I'm kidding. And Okay. Now I've got, I've got three things from Derek Jeter that he sent me: a bat, a picture of him, everybody leaving the Yankee dressing room, and there's a saying I can't show it to you, but I can explain the next one. Now there is a famous baseball player that's in the league with Babe Ruth and these guys named Ted Williams. Mm -hmm. He was the last baseball player to hit 400 in the major leagues. He was all time one of the greatest hitters to ever live. And I'm at Fenway Park, and they've invited me to throw out the first pitch. And I'm a major Yankee fan, so I caught hell for going to Fenway Park. <laughs> and so anyway, I throw out the first pitch, and there's an umpire behind the plate. And I, I, I never saw that before, but I went, okay. And I threw a strike, but he said, ball. And he said it really loud, really animated. Hmm. And all of a sudden, all this music starts playing. And the gates open up out of the bullpen. And here comes Will Farrell, dressed in a complete Red Sox uniform, walking in to relieve me. Oh, my. I didn't know this was going on. Yeah. And so the manager comes out, and he goes, you're done for the day, son. And I went, Okay, and I wait for Will Farrell to come in. I talked to Will Farrell before the game. You know, I didn't know what he was. There was a panel outside, and I thought he was just on the. 
And all of a sudden he comes full gear uniform and he, he, he takes the ball, winds up and throws it over the catcher's head. <laughs> and then the manager comes and pulls him. So they had this whole thing going on. Yeah. Oh, wow. I don't know anything about it, but it was fun. It was a, it was a great, it was really fun. Will Farrell was, Will Farrell was great. He was funny, great. Never, never stopped being, you know, trying to be funny, which is, yeah. fun. I don't either. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Uh, Desiree, thank you. That was a great uh, question. Anyway, I got to tell, wait, I got to finish the story. All right, finish so, it. I didn't even, that I didn't even, that was the beginning of the story. Okay. <laughs> well, anyway, that day, Ted Williams was at the ballpark and he was out early onto the field. And they honored him in some way after all this Will Ferrell meatloaf nonsense. Yeah. And, and they brought him out in a wheelchair. He stood up, he accepted it, put him back in the wheelchair and wheeled him away. And so I'm in this upper box. This is a good story. I'm in a, you know, one of the boxes, one of the luxury boxes. Yeah. And all of a sudden, a baseball flies up. This is a big day. A baseball flies up into the thing, and they're not batting. Hmm. And I, I go, what? And I look down, and it's the Texas Rangers are playing. This is a long story, so just deal with me. Uh, the Texas Rangers are playing. Then another ball flies up into that luxury box. I look down. It's Jose Canseco Ooh. throwing balls up into the luxury box. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, now we decide, okay, that's that. Now, and he smiles and they all wave. And now we're leaving. And we're leaving early. To, you know, we want to get to Carver. We always leave in the eighth inning, unless it's a close game. And so I'm leaving. And now, Ted Williams, his wheelchair is coming at me as I'm going out. Yeah. And the guy pushing the wheelchair stops and says, Mr. Williams, do you know who this is? And he goes, yeah, it's Meatloaf. I don't know if he figured it out because I threw out the first pitch. Yeah. And they, the guy said to him, it's his birthday. It's, it was my birthday. Wow. And Williams goes, get me a ball. And so that day on my birthday, I have a ball. He spelled my name wrong, but that's okay. My name is two words, not one. He spelled it two meatloaf, one word. Happy birthday, Ted Williams. And that ball is over there. That's one of my insane pieces. I have more insane pieces. Now, I'm moving on. The story doesn't end there. So all of a sudden, I'm getting on the elevator. And here come these guys in suits. And, and they walk in and say, you and you, out, get out of the elevator. I'm going, no. They go, they go, they pull the car back. They said, Secret Service, get out of the elevator. I'm like, okay, no problem. So I get out of the elevator. I'm standing to the side. Here comes George Bush Sr. Wow. Because the Texas Rangers. Yeah. Okay. So George Bush Sr. looks my way gets on the elevator and all of a sudden sticks his head out and he goes, Hey, meatloaf, how are you? I go, fine. And goes back in the elevator. So I, Will Farrell, Jose Canseco, Ted Williams, and George Bush, George Bush senior. All in one day. Now that's wow. a story. Absolutely. That. Oh my goodness. Uh, you've had. You've had a. You've had a really damn cool life, haven't you? <laughs> it's. It's. Well. Yeah. Until this COVID hit, but that's beside yeah. the point. Yeah. Absolutely. Everybody, absolutely. Everybody's been in the same boat. Has yeah. everybody gone to Kroger and got the syrup free Jello? It's really good. We got. I haven't been to a Kroger since I lived in Indiana, like 30, uh, 40, 45 years ago. Yeah, so. we, we now go to Kroger to get. Different things like the Jello because yes. it's, it's got a whipped cream kind of thing. So it's not just Jello; it's got like a cream thing with it. It's very good. Nice no calories, no fat. There you oh, go. Come on, let's go. All right. Well, 
That's right. Thank you. That was a wonderful question. And GalaxyCon viewers, this has been my time with Meat, but it absolutely does not have to be yours. If you'd like to chat with our well, guests. Well, come on. Do, you got time. Do one more question. One more, one more. Hey, if you, hey, if you, you want it, we'll do it. All right. We'll do it for Vivian. Oh, Vivian wants to know, what is your favorite holiday song? My favorite holiday song is Silent Night. I can't sing it because I got a sinus infection. If I didn't have it, I'd sing some. Uh, Patty Russo and I did, we did a radio show oh, 15, 16 years ago, and we sang Silent Night together live on the radio. And it was a fantastic rendition, Patty and me singing. It was great. So anyway, thank you. And that was one more question and a short answer. Oh, hey, not at all. Listen, it, uh, Meet, this has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you once again I for joining. Have more time for more questions. I'm into it, but that's okay. You so going to for one more? I'll, t I'll tell you. What, I'll tell you what. If you want to keep going, we'll go for another five minutes. How's that? Yeah, go, go, go. All right, all right, all right, all right. You you heard it. So okay, here's one from David, and he wants to know. Oh, what do you do to maintain your voice? Okay. Well, first of all, when you're on tour, you do not drink coffee. And I didn't drink coffee for probably close to 14 years. That's how many tours we were doing. From 2000, uh, 2001 to 2015, I don't think I'd drink coffee at all. Now, I, 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 right here. And so anyway, uh, but on the, on the road, what you, listen, these people don't understand, but these songs are some of the most difficult songs in the world to sing. You, you have to put them in the category of what Freddie Mercury sang and what uh, Mick Jones wrote for Foreigner and what it did to that guy's voice and what happened to Stephen Perry's voice from Journey. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't know. I do, but most people don't, and I'm not going to tell. So these songs are so hard to sing. First of all, you have to know how to sing correctly or you're not going to get through it. And the next thing you have to do is you have to warm up. I didn't when I was touring on bat, and that was a mistake uh, because I had problems with my voice for a couple of years after that tour ended. But it, and it all came back. It was all fine. But now on tour, like since 2000, after a show, I stopped talking and I have a day off. And I don't talk from the time the show ends until I get back to the dressing room a day, two, almost two days later, then I can talk again. I'm so thankful I can talk again. Yeah. But I stay in my hotel room and I watch movies and don't talk. And I have somebody, I write, <laughs> I have like uh, somebody who works for me, like um, Francis, who I love dearly, worked for me for years. She would come over and goes, do you know what you want for dinner? And I, you know, and I'd write it down. She'd order it and they'd deliver it. <laughs> and I, she'd do the same thing. I don't, I don't wake, we don't wake up early. Uh, when you're touring, you go to sleep at four, if you're lucky and wake up at, at uh, you know, mid at noon, sometimes one and then breakfast. They don't have breakfast because breakfast ends at 11 or 10 so you you can get them to make you an omelet though with no cheese that's the other thing you got to be careful for dairy you got to rest your voice you can't drink coffee it's an astringent it dries out your vocal cords oh god there's just endless you got to make sure you're warmed up yeah it, it it you have to be very 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 disciplined mm -hmm. absolutely one more question David, thank you. All right. And this will be our last one. And what do we got? And this comes from Rox. Uh, what do you still have to do on your to-do list? Oh, uh, they're endless. It's endless. My to-do list is endless. Uh, I got, we're, I've got to do more storyteller shows. I've got to try to get after four back surgeries, my muscles in my back strong enough to do 
go back into like Manchester Arena and the O2 and come over here into the garden and and I got to do, I've got to record, I have to record not the version that's in the, in the play because I had the song, What Part of My Body Hurts the Most? And it got into the play and the producers would not let me record it, which is fine. I don't mind. I like the producers. But I need to record that song. But it won't sound like it does. And it is a duet. Trust me. I hear duets. And I go to Jim. It's a duet. He goes, what? And I go, it's a duet. And I tell him, he goes, oh, okay. And so it won't, it won't sound like it is. I mean, you'll have the melody. What part of my body? And um, that's on my list. And another song. Um, uh, I can't remember something about it. I can't remember the title. I can't believe it. And those are two songs I must record. And I really want to do a country version of Fat Bottom Girls by Queen. It's a perfect country song. Fat Bottom Girls, you make the rock and wheel go round. It's a perfect country song. It's perfect. Yeah. yeah. And and don't you somebody steal that and I'll I'll tell you I'll break both your legs. So anyway, there's so much to do. I have, uh, I I need to do a TV series that runs that is credible. I need to do more film. I I need to keep working until and my my ultimate goal and I don't want people to freak out is to be on stage doing a concert when I die. And I know people will go, that's morbid. No, it's not. It's, it's, it's me giving thanks. It's me going, I give everything I have to give. And I would say before I walk out every stage, I'm willing to die on here. And I want to die. But don't get upset if I do it your concert. Don't think, <laughs> oh, my God. No, applaud me. Yeah. Well, uh, me, I, first of all, Rox, thank you. That was a wonderful question to lead us out on. List, tr seriously, my to-do list is pages and pages long. We don't have time to go through it all. No problem. No problem. We'll save that for another day. I certainly hope we do get another oh, day. Better, the best thing, I have to go to the pyramids. You haven't been there yet? No. Oh, wow. All right. I after COVID, make, make make that happen. And hopefully you come back and you can tell us all about it. I was so look forward to hearing yeah, that. I'd love to, Patty. Absolutely. Right. Can I just say something to everybody out there? Yes. Thank you very, very much for today and your questions. And I'm eternally grateful to you. And I, all of you are fans and I owe you because you paved the road for me to walk down. And I thank you for it. Just meet as I thank you on behalf of myself at GalaxyCon uh, Live. Uh, thank you for joining us here today. Uh, this has been an absolutely wonderful well, time. Them, I wouldn't be here. Absolutely. And I thank our audience for joining us. And I thank them as well for their wonderful questions. Uh, I guess Patty, you were fantastic because you know I never have anybody like you when I do questions and answers at the, uh, at the Comic Cons. I throw them away. I tell them to get away. But if you're ever around me, you can come up with me. I would absolutely love serving you in that capacity as I've served you here today. And whether it's back in our physical stages in front of your fans or back in our, in the galaxy of virtual it is, And you're okay. there or you're coming up. All right. Right on. Mate, thank you all so much. And a reminder to our audience, again, if you want to have a chat with Meatloaf, I uh, believe slots are still available. If you want to get an autographed picture, that slots are still available as well. I, Sign I've up. only got one hand. I can't really type, so I don't know how I'm going to chat with them. Well, no problem. Well, it'll be it'll be like this. It'll be uh, it'll be us talking. They'll you and the fans talking to each other one on one. Oh, just I like got it. I don't have to type. Perfect. No, you don't have to type at all. No, it's it'll be a virtual That's chat, fun. just like yeah. I have. So, with yeah. that being said, meet. Just hang out. We're gonna go backstage and to our audience once again. Thank you for joining that us. Works. Okay, I, thanks, Patty. Absolutely, ha absolutely. Have a wonderful holiday. Bye, bye. Take care. Yeah, and Merry everyone. Christmas, everyone, and, and happy Hanukkah and mm -hmm. happy whatever. Happy New Year, and everyone, take care at DalexCon.com. Check out our schedule of upcoming events just like this one. And, mate, we'll all see you on the other side of the curtain. And I'm having some coffee.